get started. Um, many of you here um, have already met and are very familiar with Dr. Wendy Chung, who is um, one of our beloved clinician researcher, geneticists, um, and, and much more in terms of being the first person um, that really wanted to support and encourage starting Project 8P Foundation and organizing all of our families together. Um, so we're really excited to have her here today um, and share with us some updated results um, about what she's learned um, from talking to a lot of the AP families so far. And I think a little bit about, you know, what does that mean about our future? So without further ado, Dr. Chung. Thank you so much, Bina. Um, I wish I could be there with you guys, um, not uh, because I did, I did so much enjoy seeing and meeting many of you in New York, and hopefully the next time uh, when COVID isn't quite as restrictive in traveling, I will be able to meet up again. So I wanted to give you an update. I, I hope you can hear me and see me okay. If, if not, someone just yell at me. But uh, I wanted to give an update in terms of the findings from the Project 8P. And I do want to give credit, um, Vulcan O'Kor is someone that many of you know and met before, but he really is um, uh, deserves a lot of the credit, most of the credit, in fact, for this. So are we okay, Bina? Can you hear me okay? We are perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so in terms of doing this, the reason why we're doing this is to help you understand this condition better, and in some cases to be able to have some sense of what might be coming ahead in the future, uh, or to explain some of the things that you're seeing. Um, as I'll be talking about, it is uh, complicated, and I'll try and make this as simple as I can, but it is complicated. And so there are some limitations in what I'm going to explain um, and whether or not this everything I explain uh, sort of is relevant to each of you. You have to be careful as I go through because there are many sort of subgroups even within the AP group and I'll try and make that clear in just a second. Um, as we're doing this, we are trying to get at the level of understanding which genes are relevant, and this is true actually for families across the three different conditions gathered in Colorado, uh, by understanding specifically which genes are, um, I'm going to use the term driver, but are major contributors to what we're seeing that goes on in the brain and the body, will help us understand ultimately therapeutically where to focus more of our energies, and so that's some of what um, many of you contributed in terms of being able to understand the exact, we call them breakpoints, but the exact regions on AP that were involved. And um, everyone should, just as a, a small point, everyone should have gotten their results back from those studies if you requested them. And if there's anyone who submitted samples who didn't get results back or didn't understand results, be sure and reach out to me. We'll be glad to go through those with you again. Um, so in doing this, uh, I, I wanted to give a little bit of information again about the uh, how we got to where we are in terms of the data. Many people signed up either in New York or online. Um, we tried to uh, accommodate people from around the world. So you will see that this is an international registry. And as we did this, we assured ourselves that each person that I'm going to uh, ex explain and include to you today um, belonged in this club because we reviewed their genetic test reports and ensured that they really did have something on AP. Now, some folks had uh, what we call cited genetics or had a karyotype many, many years ago and may not have had the resolution on chromosome 8 b that I'm going to be showing you today. So some people were generous enough to give us another sample, either a blood sample or saliva sample, where we did higher resolution characterization of chromosome 8P and really were able to define very specifically what the genes and even the DNA segments um, that were included within either the deletion or duplication. So I will include that in the data that I'm showing today. Um, as we did this, we tried to, where we could, document anything by medical record review, by the medical records that you provided and that we abstracted, and then also talking with you, um, and in some cases going through something called a Vineland Adaptive Behavioral Scale or a standardized instrument that we could do remotely where you didn't necessarily have to be with us in the office. 
So I know this is old hat to most of you, so I'm going to go through it relatively quickly, but um, each of the three groups united uh, for the meeting is united because there's something different about their chromosomes. Um, just a very brief orientation that I think you already know, uh, but in terms of the anatomy of the chromosome, there are different arms. Uh, P arm or petite arm uh, is the way we would describe the shorter of the two arms of the chromosome, and uh, this is not original, I'm embarrassed to say, but um, Q comes after P, and so the long arm was named the Q arm of the chromosomes. Um, with this, the reason I make this point is because on chromosome 8, we're going to be focusing on people that have a difference of the P arm. So with the chromosomes in each of you, whether it's uh, uh, chromosome 14 or 15 or chromosome 8, um, the chromosomes are actually arranged in order from largest to smallest. And so chromosome 8 is about here in the middle. As I said, it's got a P and a Q arm. Um, and so that's what we see when we look under the microscope. Um, individuals with the, the rearrangements that I'm going to be talking about for this group specifically, I'll show you a, a schematic in a second, um, have all different types of rearrangements, and that makes it a little bit complicated. I'm going to try and break them out for you. Um, but some individuals have deletions. So they have, as you can see, this is what we call a reference chromosome. And then this is a chromosome that's like this one, but it's got a deletion. It's got this yellow part that's missing. There are other people that have a duplication. So they have kind of a copy paste here. And then some individuals who have an inversion, who have their segment flipped around. Um, now, this is specific for chromosome 8P, and uh, within this, there are different bands. These are road marks or um, sort of um, milestones or mile markers along the chromosome for us to be able to get oriented and see where we are. Um, you don't need to worry about these so much, but sometimes that gobbledygook of the genetic test reports tells you that it's uh, P for the P arm, and then it will tell you some of these segments, either 11.1 or 23.2, but it's these signposts along the chromosome 8. Um, for individuals that are the most common of the group that I'm going to talk about, they have a complex rearrangement called an inversion, INV, duplication, DUP, deletion, DEL, 8P. If that isn't a mouthful, um, inversion, duplication, deletion, 8P. And what this is, uh, is that here's again chromosome 8P. Here's this region here. Um, and this region here has been duplicated. So you can see two segments of the blue here. And there's also a deletion. So this red segment here is missing. And if you look carefully at the banding pattern here, you'll see that this part of it is inverted. And so that's why we call it an inversion of a duplication and a deletion for 8P. So that's kind of complicated, but that's what's going on. Now, here's where it gets a little bit more complicated. And for those of you who are listening either in the room or online or even later, um, you're going to have to be able to now think about your genetic test uh, report and what that tells you about the person with 8P in your family and which one of these subgroups you're a member of. Because I'm going to try and present this in parallel so that I can cover as many people as possible. Um, but I might have left someone out if there weren't, if you were a very special, unique person and there weren't as many people in your group for comparison. And so I'm glad to answer questions offline, but that's the way all the rest of the slides are going to be organized. So let me orient you again. So here's chromosome 8P. It's the same chromosome, but it's now lying down. So instead of being standing up, it's now lying down. Um, within this, I've colored regions. Uh, and so for all of these, these are the what we call nucleotides. So this is the region spanning chromosome 8P. Um, color coded here, each line, each sort of row or each line here is representing a different person. Regions that are red are regions that are deleted. So for that person, they're missing that, that region. And that could be true for this person, or this person, or this person, or this person. Um, and the sections that are blue are duplicated. So it's an extra bit of that region. Now, the reason I'm showing it to you this way is that, again, remember that each row represents a person. And you can see that 
it's almost the case that no two people are exactly alike in terms of either the region of the deletion or the region of the duplication, but I am going to be a lumper, uh, lumper in the sense that everyone from this line and above, all of these folks here, and there are actually almost 50 of them and what I'm going to show you, I'm lumping them all together because they have a, a basically the same deletion and they have approximately the same duplication. And so they're more similar than dissimilar. So I'm grouping these together in the things that I'm going to be showing you. There are also some individuals um, that have deletions, and there are some individuals um, that have, we call these proximal. Um, don't worry about the words too much, but this group I'm going to lump together. These have an 8P proximal deletion. You'll notice they don't have the duplication and their deletion is a little bit smaller. Um, there are some individuals who have the distal 8P deletion. So this is farther away. And so again, I'm going to put all of these groups of uh, people together in one group. And then there's some individuals who have a deletion that spans both proximal and distal. So I'm going to call these P and D, proximal and distal. Um, and those are the groups that I'm going to spend the most time talking about. The one thing that I do want to make clear is that there are some people with different types of rearrangements. And so these are some other folks. Um, and again, every line is a different person. Um, there are some people who had deletions, but they were sort of atypical deletions. They might have been teeny tiny, really small here. They might have been relatively larger, but they didn't line up with other folks. And it was hard to be able to know how to lump people together. So there are some cases of, I called them right here, 8P other, um, where I left them out of the analysis because the size of the deletion was really not characteristic of the others, and I didn't feel it was really fair to lump them together. So some people are, like I said, a little bit different and a little bit more unique. Um, so within this, you'll also see that I didn't include any of the very variable duplications, again, because these were um, less typical and, and I was trying to be um, get sample sizes or get numbers and groups to be large enough to say something meaningful about them. Okay, so that's the introduction, a lot of complex sided genetics, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but now let me dive into this and let me try and orient you about how all the next slides are. So for each slide, it's based on a particular category of symptoms, and each column here is a different group. So now what you've got to do is, in your mind, figure out what column you belong to, and then for each of the slides, focus only on that column. If you want to look at the other columns, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But if you want to try and keep it simple, then focus on just the column that's your condition. So as I said, for those with the inversion deletion or duplication deletion 8P, that first group that I said was most common, you'll always want to focus on this leftmost column here. And then, as I said, if you have the distal deletion, you're here, the proximal and distal deletion, you're here, and the proximal deletion, you're here. Okay, so you're going to look, like I said, through all the next slides. Of what I'm going to talk about. So number one is I'm showing you the n equals tells you how many people are in each of those groups. So for this um, inversion, duplication, deletion, we've got a pretty robust group of almost 50 people. That's great. I feel confident in what we're saying about those numbers. On the other hand, you'll see with some of these other groups, the numbers are smaller because these are less common. Um, doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them or anything else. They're just less common. Um, and so with that, we only have four, uh, for instance, for the deletion 8P distal. And so just appreciate that there might be individuals who don't fit this particular mold for these four individuals because it's only four individuals. Um, so just appreciate that. Uh, another limitation in terms of this is that this is mostly um, a description of individuals who are children. Um, I don't have, you know, unlike, even though, as Bino was saying, we do have some older individuals in the community, some heroes who are in their 30s, 40s, even uh, older than that, most individuals that are, who are in our community who participated um, are still children. So as an example, the average age, seven, about seven years of age, uh, older here, um, and, you know, a variety or range of ages. And I'm showing you again here, um, sort of this last row here, the range from the youngest to just under a year of age to the oldest, about 27 years of age. So again, just appreciate that there might be some things that happen when you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s that maybe we haven't uh, represented here. Okay, so one common issue is with growth, and I won't go 
through this particular slide in too much detail because I don't think it's so important, but um, you told us you went back to your baby books and you told us how much your baby weighed when they were born or how much your child weighed uh, when they were born, the length, the head circumference, and in general, people, uh, some people tend to, to be on the slightly smaller side, but not teeny tiny. And I won't go through all of the other details because that's kind of been there, done that. Um, more importantly, though, is as individuals are growing up, there are still some challenges in terms of either growth issues um, or, in certain cases, endocrine issues or, or hormone issues. Um, it's not, uh, I would say, you know, a life-threatening issue, but just in terms of understanding where it comes from, because sometimes people get worried if they're on the shorter side or on the heavier side. Um, we do have within each of the groups, again, remember to uh, look at your column, um, anywhere between about 10 to 25% of individuals who are short, um, and not just on the shorter side, but meaningfully short. Uh, we also have a good group of individuals, and I'd say I've experienced this quite a bit, a good group of individuals who have trouble with gaining weight. They tend to be skinnier, um, and again, this is part of the condition, so I don't want people to get overly nervous that you know their child is wasting away or anything like that. Um, for some of the individuals, and again, remember that these two groups tended to have older individuals, and so this may be a difference over the life course, um, that they had more individuals who were heavier. I will also say these numbers are not unlike the rest of the United States population, so uh, I'm not necessarily pointing fingers saying that they're obese. Um, they're just like the rest of Americans in terms of that, um, but, uh, and that, as I said, may be because they were older as well. Okay, so most of the features that we see are, um, I'm going to describe as above the shoulders. Um, so I think of these as the brain and behavior. And what I've done for each of these other, again, each column, um, I've taken the sum for the first line of all the features of neurological findings. So 90%, the vast majority of individuals, 75, 192% have some sort of neurological findings. Or for seizures, again, about 50%, for instance, of individuals with inversion dupe del uh, 8P have some sort of, have had some sort of seizures. And then I started breaking it down, low muscle tone, high muscle tone, um, not being so coordinated, being clumsy in terms of walking, running, hopping, skipping, jumping, uh, larger head size, smaller head size. And then when it comes to the seizure type, um, something that can just look like staring off into space, what we call absent seizures, um, important to me to highlight this for you because this is actually over a third of the individuals and these can sometimes be difficult to diagnose and can be missed. And so uh, really oftentimes it's only when we put on the EEG or the electroencephalogram and especially when we have the video watching at those times and we can see someone spacing out and seeing at the same time that the electrical waves are showing us that there's a seizure that we can make that diagnosis. Um, but these can be a variety of other types. It can also be sort of jerk types of seizures or what we call tonic-clonic seizures um, or abnormal EEGs in general, again, seen in about half of people. Uh, across the different conditions, just appreciate that, again, um, the frequency is lower, uh, but importantly, if there are seizures present, really important to treat them uh, because they can otherwise result in, I think of it as an electrical storm in your brain, where it's hard to be able to think straight, literally, um, if you're having seizures all the time. And so that impedes learning and impedes uh, being able able to really make gains from a developmental point of view. I won't go into it in too much detail, but many individuals also had MRIs or magnetic resonance imaging of the brain to be able to see inside the head to see what was going on. Um, we did see several different things, uh, the connection between the right and the left side of the brain, what we call the corpus callosum, oftentimes a little bit thinner, uh, but still uh, usually having a connection between the right and the left side of the brain. Some other things, but generally not things that required neurosurgery, for instance, generally not things that required someone to go in and do anything. It was just simply part of the workup initially um, as people were trying to understand what was going on. But I, I want to reassure you, not something that looks like it's changing or that necessarily needs intervention. Um, a common issue that I know um, um, I know many of you have told me personally about some of these things are just uh, behavioral differences. And I would say that this tends to change over the life course. Um, it's different, I think, in younger children than it is in adolescence, as an example. And it also seems to vary in terms of ability to communicate. So uh, the better individuals can communicate, the less frustrating life is. And so you can sometimes understand uh, why some of the behaviors are what they are at the times when they are. Um, but in terms of this, again, 
you know, a variety, I would say these are uh, some days trying days. I understand this as a mother in terms of some of the days where, you know, you just uh, have an all out tantrum. Um, and for some individuals, they may have issues in terms of focusing like attention issues, um, not as frequent as some other conditions that I see, but autism can be a part of this or autistic like behaviors. Um, but I'm saying can be because I actually, in my experience, many individuals are um, not as much, in fact, not at all autistic, but in quite, in fact, quite social and quite loving and really connect in terms of um, being able to socially engage and interact. And I'll come a little bit more to that later. Um, some of these things, though, in terms of the uh, teaching strategies, ABA therapy that we use for autism can still be helpful even for individuals without autism, though. So I, I want to just plant that seed for you as well. Um, there is a gene that we know is in the region of 8P, which contributes to congenital heart disease. And so we do see quite frequently congenital heart disease. It is one of the things below the shoulders uh, that we see most commonly. I am very happy to say that for the most part, this is something that either resolves itself without surgery, or it's a relatively straightforward intervention. May not even be surgery, but other things to be able to close a little hole in the heart of a ventricular septal defect or an atrial septal defect. And this this is the type of thing you're either born with it or not, it doesn't come up later. Um, so if you have an echocardiogram or some uh, ultrasound waves to look at the heart and see what the structure is, if it's not there, you're not going to have to worry about it coming up later. Um, but one key is that if you haven't, uh, if the individual in your family hasn't had an echo, it is important to get that echocardiogram done. Um, I would say that gastrointestinal or tummy issues are relatively more common. It's nothing serious. It's not generally something life-threatening, but it is uh, certainly annoying. And uh, in terms of uh, life, daily life issues, something that comes up quite frequently. Um, I oftentimes see individuals that are who are constipated in the same way that their muscle tone may be lower or their core tone may be lower, um, their tone in the intestine may be lower, and things just take a long time to get through. And with that, um, may be associated with constipation, and then people get backed up, and uh, that can ca cause some belly aches. And so there's no magic bullet in terms of doing this, but each family has their own way of between a uh, combination of diet, in some cases medicines, in some cases a regular time of day that they're going, um, but ways of being able to deal with that. And then some cases, um, especially when the children are younger, having trouble with feeding and even some individuals who need gastrostomy tubes or uh, tubes into the belly to help with eating. But uh, generally a lot of these things, there are workarounds or there are ways of being able to deal with them. In terms of some other uh, medical issues with orthopedic or bone issues, um, again, remembering the age of our, our young people, some people do have scoliosis or curvature of the spine. This in particular has been coming up more frequently when individuals are going through their growth spurt during adolescence. And remember what I said that many of our kiddos, especially in inversion, uh, dupe del, uh, are still younger. They may not have gone through adolescence yet. And so this may be an underestimate of the lifetime risk of scoliosis. Um, otherwise, there are some other things I would say for the most part, these tend to be more minor things, uh, but there can be issues in terms of joint issues, uh, either congenital differences with the way the joints formed, but can cause problems in terms of hip pain, knee pain. Um, and the one thing that we're, I think we need to watch carefully as individuals are growing up and getting older is in the same way you ha can have arthritis as an adult, whether or not any of this is associated with any greater pain or arthritis um, as our young people get to be a little bit older. Um, vision issues. I know many of you looking around the room, many of the kiddos have glasses, and that's because there can be a variety of vision issues. Some of them are in the eyes themselves and uh, are amenable to glasses. This is what I've called refractive errors. Um, but some individuals, it's actually in the brain. So what we call cortical visual impairment is not with the eyes, but it's actually the brain receiving the, those visual signals. So there's a combination of those two, but again, because the eyes are the window into the brain and how we learn so very much, it's important to make sure those are corrected and seen by a pediatric ophthalmologist. Um, these are things that usually, uh, again, especially a special needs pediatric ophthalmologist will be able to best uh, figure out the glasses and the prescription glasses that are going to be necessary to get that correction. And in some cases, even surgery, eye surgery for a lazy eye or eyes that are not aligned well. 
Okay, in the last couple minutes, um, I'm going to go through, uh, these are now graphs, but they are set up the same way, the same order. Um, so if you remembered what column you were in, just think about this in the same way. Um, this is to give you, especially for some parents who might be listening in of young children, uh, being able to set some expectations about when certain milestones might come up. So in this particular case, this is sitting. So average age at sitting. And this on the y-axis is months. And so again, and divide that by 12 to figure out number of years. Um, but the average age at sitting, for instance, for the inversion dupe dells um, was uh, about a year and a half, or uh, I'm sorry, about a year. I'm sorry, I misspoke. About a year is the line here for the average. Um, but each dot represents a person. And so you can see that there's some variability, some people sitting up uh, independently younger, uh, but some quite a bit older in terms of that age. The other groups in terms of the deletions only, you can see it's a much tighter distribution, fewer people, but also um, uh, seem to be more similar between the groups of individuals and generally sitting up somewhere between six and 10 months of age. Um, taking their first steps in terms of walking, again, set up the same way uh, with the groups. Uh, I've added one group here, one extra group here. Um, uh, to mainly show individuals who were uh, not yet walking and to show their current age. Um, so these are individuals with these two groups that are in the inversion dupe del. These individuals have not yet started walking, but these individuals, when they had started walking, on average, they were starting to walk between about three and a half or almost four years of age. Um, you can see that some people aren't walking yet because they're younger than that. There are also, oops, a few people who are a little bit older than that who haven't started walking yet, but hopefully uh, we'll be able to achieve that milestone. And then again, for the other groups, um, as I said, oftentimes um, about a little bit older, but about uh, 12 months of age. Uh, for talking or first words, again, separated out in the same way. So the inversion dupe del group split out between those who have not yet started talking with their first words versus those who have started. Then again, in terms of being able to see when individuals had started talking, it's about two years of age for those who have started talking and for those who haven't in part because they're young, but also some individuals who are a little bit older who haven't yet started talking. And again, for the other groups, um, you can see that they were on average younger when they started talking. So the last slide or second to the last slide I'm going to go over is um, this measure that I called the Vineland Behavioral Scale. So this is for parents to be able to uh, give us some observations in a standardized way about what they're seeing in their child. Again, it's divided out within the same four groups that I described before. And each one of these different colors is a different domain within the Vinelands. Um, within this, you can see that uh, we have uh, different scores and don't worry so much about the absolute numbers on the scores. What I think is more helpful to see is the different areas of strength and weakness. So as I was saying before, for the, the group with the inversion dupe del, um, one of the areas of strength is really socialization. Um, so unlike, uh, for instance, autism, as I was describing before, it's actually an area of relative strength in terms of being able to connect with individuals, socialize, and to the extent that I think it's um, not maybe not perfect, in part it's because communication skills. So this uh, sort of darker gray here, communication is more challenging. And as you can imagine, if you can't talk with someone, it's harder to connect with them. On the other hand, another area where they're relatively stronger is motor skills. Um, certainly, I'm still not saying it's normal, but relatively stronger. Um, and then also daily living skills. Um, but challenges in all the areas, but again, a strength in social. Um, as opposed to individuals with the proximal deletion, they tend to be relatively similar across different domains, although motor, which is walking, running, skipping, jumping, things like that, tend to be relatively stronger. Um, and again, with the other two groups, uh, the distal deletion in particular tends to be uh, a little bit stronger than, not surprisingly, the individuals missing parts of both the proximal and the deletion uh, regions. So in summary, uh, one of the things I want to emphasize is that so far, it looks like everyone is continuing to make progress forward. 
Um, admittedly, it's slower, um, but uh, not stagnating, not falling back, not deteriorating, not declining. So um, I think that's really reassurance. Um, what I have been seeing personally is that some of the younger children, uh, as they're diagnosed younger and starting into therapies earlier and having a better sense of what therapies are working, um, I think are definitely uh, learning from all of the older folks in terms of being able to hopefully get on the right track sooner. So I'm seeing some of the young ones um, doing really much better than I saw with some of the older individuals. Um, so I think we've got a lot to learn from each other is the good thing. I will say that there's a warning um, that some of the individuals who had very, very small deletions or duplications in the series that we saw, we did see a few individuals that were pretty severely impacted. And I'm, I have a hypothesis. I don't know if this is true yet or not, but some of those individuals may have another diagnosis. So they may have, I sometimes call it a dual diagnosis, and they may truly have what's going on with chromosome 8P. I'm not, I'm not denying that, but there may be something else that's going on as well, whether it's genetic, um, something else that might be seen with some sort of other genetic test, or whether it's a completely different indication, different reason and an infection, a trauma, or something else that was going on, um, but there might be something besides just chromosome 8P. So as I said, um, I hope this is giving you some guidance. Um, for the most part, I think kids are getting good inventories when they're little and people you know, can cross things off the list and not have to worry about them in the future. Um, but the main challenge has been for kids with education. And I know COVID has made it that much harder uh, for individuals in some cases to get the resources they need to. So I'm looking forward to the time of getting back to normal and hopefully getting our kiddos back on track and into their therapies. So I'll be able to stop there and uh, take questions if we have time. And if we don't have time, I'm glad to answer your questions by email. Uh, we, we have um, a few minutes. Um, so it's still a small group. There's a microphone so that Wendy can hear you guys. I know you have questions. I'm looking at you, Laura. Oh, there, Amber. Um, is this data, are we going to be able to see this data um, in a downloadable spreadsheet or slide show? Um, so you, you will be able to see the data. I'm certainly happy to share the exact slides that I've shown you. And then the other thing is that this is going to be published in a medical journal called Genetics and Medicine. And what I'll be glad to do, um, uh, don't tell the publishers this, but anyway, you guys will get a copy of this and uh, we won't break any copyright laws, but we'll make sure everyone gets a copy of this and you can have all the supplemental tables and everything else that's there. And importantly, uh, be sure to take this to your doctors, your providers, so that they can also get smart about this um, and be able to use the information. Hi, doctor. Thank you for the presentation. I was wondering if you have any indication. Our son has uh, inverted deletion duplication. Um, he does not experience seizures. He turns four in just a little bit, a couple weeks here. Is there any indication? Like, are we out of the woods at this point? Is the I mean, can they start? Is there like an average age when they start, or is it just yeah. all over the map? Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, I. I because he's almost four at this point, I think it's very likely that he's out of the woods. Um, you know, I can't, I never say never is, you know, one of the things. Um, we certainly did have some people that had febrile seizures, not necessarily epilepsy forever, but when they were within the setting of a high fever, it might've sort of lowered that threshold and they might've had something. Um, but generally, especially if you've had an EEG already, and they said the EEG, like a 24 hour video EEG, if you've had that and they said it was normal, it's a very, very good sign. Thank you. Uh, piggybacking off that. So you don't feel like necessarily the neurochemical changes that come with puberty raise the chance of seizures starting? So there are the limitations, as I said, of our cohort or our group being on the younger side. So I can't say for sure that, you know, it's never, never going to happen. Um, but in terms of first seizure for the ones that were old enough to go through this, we weren't seeing a lot of people having their first seizure during adolescence or during puberty. So just don't let them grow up, right? <laughs> we never want our kids to grow up. I, one of the other questions that came up earlier um, when we saw and we um, seen a presentation by another geneticist that was a little bit more broad and not specific to AP. Um, AP has a very large region in terms of number of genes. 
And um, the comparison was to a Down syndrome um, where you have a third copy of an entire chromosome, but in comparison, don't necessarily see the severity of the intellectual disability um, in Down versus AP. And, and so is the number of genes or the volume indicative of what we're saying, you know, as like penetrant or dosage or genetically rich? Yep. So those are good questions. Um, so I'll try and make the analogy. It's not just size that matters, but it's also um, sort of population density, if you will. So I'll give you the analogy. So you guys are out in beautiful Colorado, um, and I'm back here in Manhattan. And, uh, you know, within this, I'm in a very densely populated area. So I hope this doesn't happen, but if a bomb were to go off, you know, where I'm sitting, um, we would end up sort of, there'd be a lot of casualties uh, because we have a lot of people in a very small area. Um, and, you know, where you guys are, and again, hopefully nothing like this ever happens, but uh, it wouldn't have as much um, sort of collateral damage. And so sometimes the same thing, I think of the same thing in terms of the gene density along chromosomes. And then there's something that we call um, sort of, um, anyway, how much it tolerates either having extra or um, one less copy of the gene. And so there's some genes that they don't matter. As long as they have one copy, it doesn't matter, but they could have one, two, or three. Other copies, other genes are very, very exquisitely sensitive, dosage sensitive to whether it's too much or too little. I'm pretty sure that it's not just one gene. I, I think part of this was your question, Bina, and this is part of chromosome 21 or Down syndrome. I don't think this is all one gene for any of those conditions. I think our question, which we don't really know now is, is it four genes that account for 80% of the difference? Is it 10 genes that account for 50%? You know, I think we make some guesses and we've got some ideas. And as I said, for GATA4 for congenital heart disease, I think that's a big portion, but you know, everyone in the community is missing GATA4 in the same way and not everyone has congenital heart disease. So there are things that buffer against this as well. Um, it, it's something that everyone, well, not everyone, a lot of really smart people are working on. And I just wanna put out a quick shout out to Bina that it's been uh, for 8P, Project 8P specifically, a lot of her hard work that's rallied the troops in terms of getting scientists interested in working on this um, that there are really some now world-class scientists working on trying to figure out which one of those genes are the important ones. Thank you, everyone. Um, Wendy, we did we do have some clinicians slash clinician researchers here. I don't know if any of you had questions about the paper. Um, we can pass the mic. No pressure at all. No, we're just excited to see it. You're just excited, to, excited to, read to read the paper. Yeah, I think so. I think we're all very excited um, about that. And so there's a team here from um, Children's Hospital of Colorado. And yesterday um, we launched our neurogenetics multidisciplinary clinic. Um, and they were able to see five AP heroes um, yesterday in clinic. And thank you so much for spending all of that gracious time um, there. And I'm really hopeful that, you know, as we kind of expand and think about this, and Dr. Chung has seen so many AP heroes um, that we can put our heads together a little bit more and better understand and, and really get to a level of quality clinical care across all of the specialties and all the questions that we have as we see our children grow and as we see Richie um, as an adult here and how amazing he is. Um, so thank you again. But feel free to grab the mic if there are some questions. Okay, well, we'll pass on that, Wendy. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, but thank you so much for your time. We're just really looking forward to it. Um, oh, yeah, one more question. Great, from a parent. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you hear, Wendy? You might have to repeat the question. Okay, hold on. We're going to no. pass the mic. Thanks. Hi, Dr. Chung. Thank you so much for the presentation and information. Um, I guess one thing I've been wondering about is, is you know, there's these layers of, of, uh, you know, of people we know about with AP chromosomal differences, right? There's, there's people who have found you know, the foundation and, and we're able to connect this way. There's people who might have the diagnosis and not connected. And then there's people who, um, like, like, Re like Reggie, Ricky really recently, um, you know, he didn't even know exactly that it was a chromosome eight difference. Um, so is there, is there any indication or 
you know, in the United States or worldwide, what the numbers might be like for for uh, chromosome eight differences, even if a lot of those people haven't found our community yet. Right. So this is, um, I have to say, I think this is the third time today I've thought about this type of question um, in the sense that uh, I think there are a lot of people who are undiagnosed, who, who carry some sort of diagnosis, but not necessarily the genetic diagnosis and don't know what the club they're in. Um, I will say for those of you who are listening, a lot of the clinicians probably who are in the audience, with myself included, have worked really hard to be able to get insurance coverage in the United States. And we have colleagues in France, the UK, uh, in the Netherlands and Germany, um, who are all working really hard to be able to get patients access to this testing. And there are initiatives that are going to be starting, I think, in terms of even trying to get um, early diagnoses shortly after birth for individuals so that no one's left behind and everyone can get their diagnosis. Um, within this, though, in terms of numbers, I think we're on the order of one in 100,000-ish, but very much on the ish um, in terms of how frequent this is. And so within this, it is important to band together and stick together. And, and that's why I'm so pleased at how Bina uh, had the vision to set this up to include all of chromosome 8P, um, because we really need to stick together. And even though I, I showed some differences, mainly for transparency, so people wouldn't get confused, it is really important because the lessons learned from different segments of chromosome 8P and overlapping segments, I think, are going to help each other out. And so it is important for us to stick together when we're rare. Okay, great.